It's my great pleasure and joy to welcome you all to our final Zika Plan dissemination event. Zika Plan stands for Zika Preparedness Latin American Network. My name is Annelise Wildersmith and I am the scientific coordinator of Zika Plan. Zika Plan is funded by the European Commission and brought together 25 leading research and public health organizations over the past five years from Latin America, North America, Africa, Asia, and Europe. To mark the culmination of now almost five years of transnational efforts, we have been hosting a series of open access public webinars featuring some of the key scientific findings of our consortium. Today is the last of such events. This time it will be different. While during the first couple of webinars, we focus on the science, today we will focus on the legacy that Zika Plan will leave behind uh, in the, uh, in, for, for the Zika field, but also beyond Zika. Today is also different as we will have the coordinators from Zika Alliance, Zika Action and Recoded with us. United, we are stronger in tackling Zika and we want to showcase the strength of this collaboration. Before I continue, I would like to first thank the Global Health Network for hosting these webinars. In particular, many thanks to Raman Preet from Umeå University and to Bonnie Baker from the Oxford University and from the Global Health Network for pulling together all the strengths to make these webinars happen. Let me move first to some housekeeping um, a points. So this webinar is being recorded. Participant videos and microphones have been disabled. Uh, if you do want to communicate with us, and we encourage you to communicate us with us, please use the chat box. You can introduce yourself and you can post any comments. Uh, be sure when you do so that you select all panelists and attendees from the list so that we can all see it. To the panelists, I would like to encourage you to also join any you know, discussions, questions, comments, uh, and you have the opportunity to, to just turn on your video, unmute yourself uh, and talk. Um, so uh, please use the Q&A box. So there's a Q&A box on the right hand side uh, to submit your questions throughout the seminars. So the Q&A box is really where we will look through uh, uh, what questions came up and, and the moderator will then pull out those questions. You can also um, you know, give your signals, your, 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 your what's it called, <laughs> your thumbs up if you like the question and then it will be put, um, it will be prioritized. Um, all right, so these were the housekeeping announcements back to the first slide. We will now have a, uh, we will start with a panel panel discussion. So why a panel discussion? Um, and so building sustainable research networks and all the capacities needed to respond to Zika or the emergence of another uh, pathogen uh, is the core of Zika plan. But this was only possible because of the collaboration with other research net networks, in, in particular with other EU funded Zika consortia. And so we really had a tremendous collaboration over the past years with Zika Action and Zika Alliance. Uh, and these Zika consortia were unique in that we designed additional work packages for shared communication platforms, shared newsletters, governance structures, shared ethics approach. So, so, so in total, the three of us uh, really encompass many countries and many trial sites and study sites in the Caribbean and South America. So uh, it's now a pleasure to announce the moderator who is no other than Dr. Arjon von Hengel, who is the team leader of infectious diseases uh, at the DG Research and Innovation of the European Commission. So, so welcome and, uh, to Arjon and I would also like to announce the panelists and I would like to ask all the panelists to now turn on your video so you are visible. So we will have Xavier de Lombalari, who is the Sick Alliance 
coordinator, Carl, Professor Carlo Giacquinto, who's a SIG action coordinator. We have Thomas Jenisch, who, uh, who was part of SIG Alliance, where he led all the clinical cohort studies. And as a result of this, um, uh, achieved to obtain another um, EU funded a consortium called Recoded. So he re represents Recoded today, and he will share you more what it actually is. I'm very pleased to also uh, welcome Professor Carlos Pardo Villamizar, who is originally uh, Colombian, is now based in the US, but really through his connections and his networks, we were able to build up a very strong Eurozika network in Colombia, and he will share more about it. And last but not least, not least is Professor Trudy Lang, who is from Oxford University, who is the overall coordinator of the Global Health Network and who led the work package, um, uh, which, uh, and then a network that she called Ready. And Ready is the Portuguese and Spanish name for network, um, uh, where, where she brings, where she has a cross cutting work package with all the three consortia. So, welcome, Trudy. Uh, I will now hand over to the moderator and happy to help you as well, Arion, wherever you need it. And anyone feel free to post your questions and, and anyone else, you know, feel free to, to chip in. Over to Arion. Thank you, Annelies, for the introduction and your kind words. So I would like to first uh, wish everybody a nice day. It might be a good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening, depending on the place of the world where you are. So. Um, first of all, my excuse is that uh, my director, Irene Nostad, would not be able to, to participate here and to do the moderation. She would have liked to do that, but at the last moment, because we are dealing with the pandemic, and there are so many urgencies that she was in the end prevented to, uh, to do this, so she asked me to replace her. So I'm very happy to do this, of course, because the Zika projects have a special situation and a special place almost in our heart, I would say, because it is work on infectious diseases that is particular dealing with epidemics and pandemics. And it's very clear nowadays, of course, what this situation is, that you need to work together in the case of an epidemic or a pandemic, that you have to initiate your research reaction in time for that to collect the, the data to fill the knowledge gaps. And you can only do that in collaboration. And I think that is really the power here of these projects that we're talking about that are dealing with an epidemic on a worldwide scale. So your projects have started in 2016. And that was really a moment that we started a new initiative in this area so that we were looking for these infectious diseases really outside the borders of Europe and go for a worldwide collaboration. Now, of course, if you are starting that and, and you are kind of trendsetters in this area, you also have to face many obstacles. And, and of course, that is very clear, but it's very important also to find out what the problems are that, that you're running into and try to find as researchers solutions to come up with that. So I think that a very important element was also the fact that these three consortia worked closely together via common work uh, package across the three projects because that really allowed a deeper collaboration between the projects and and this was something quite innovative we did not have that in many projects and i think that it's also setting a certain trend that we've also continued in in other projects that are funded nowadays so working worldwide of course also makes that you have a special situation and in the consortium of research funders around the, the globe, the Globit uh, consortium, that has also been in the spotlight. So the workshops on synergies that they have organized on Zika is, of course, very much helped by, by the work that you've been doing in your three projects. So this collaboration, I said, is very important because it avoids duplication and it makes better and a more efficient use of resources. And it helps us, of course, to, to work together with another part of the, of the world, and especially, of course, in the Latin American research region, where we now set up via your project a research preparedness uh, uh, network. And as I said, this has also influenced what we are doing on the European scale. So in Europe, for instance, we have the PREPARE project that is working on, on emergencies 
and that has already the links with uh, with what's happening in the, your Zika projects. And it also, of course, in EDCTP, where we're working together with Africa, you see that this collaboration between different projects is based on, on the idea that you're also using in the Zika projects. Now, a very important element here, of course, is also the data sharing. And again, that is not something that you can take for granted. I think in, in the emergency and the public health response, this data sharing is very important because researchers can build on existing data, they can use each other's data, and in that way, actually catalyze their own research. So making this data quickly available in emergency situations like a pandemic or an, an, an epidemic is in, very important. And it also allows you, of course, to pool data if possible, so that you can generate stronger, more robust results in a faster way. So I'm very happy that the efforts that the Zika projects have put into this have really advanced the field a lot and, and led to cooperation that was not there before. And Another aspect, of course, that the Zika projects have played an important role in is the setting up of cohorts. And they are, of course, crucial for research preparedness. And that is also recognized in, in the organizations like, uh, like Globe with R. It is also now very relevant, of course, for the COVID-19 pandemic, where, for instance, on the European uh, level, we have funded the orchestra projects that also has links with in other parts of the world, including the uh, Latin American region. So taking all this together, I think that the, the Zika epidemic has led to a research response through your three projects that have really changed the, the field as such by bringing in a more global approach, a stronger collaboration between different parts of the world by setting up and collecting data in a, in a way that had not been done before in, in also an area where maybe um, big advances could be made. So again, coming back to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, of course, we see that everything that has been initiated under the, the three Zika project has very much been instructing and, and a learning exercise for our activities also to deal with the, globe, with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I would like to thank you already for all the work that you have done and uh, make sure that what we are doing here on the European Commission level is learning from what has been set up within the Zika projects and also use that knowledge for further investment for the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and also in the context of the, the, the new ideas, for instance, like, like the Health Emergency and Response Agency that is being set up on the European level to use this experience that has been generated by you and to deal uh, with the current pandemic and, and to maybe further um, put investment into this area. So I would like to thank you again for your invitation. And now actually I would like to go over to ask some questions to the coordinators of the Zika projects. So if you allow me, Annalisa, I would like to start with you. And I would like to ask you if in about five minutes you could tell me what achievement of your project is likely to have the greatest long-term impact. So that is on your project level, but also what is the advantage of the collaborative effort? So with having these three consortia together, is there maybe something that you have now achieved that you could not achieve without this collaboration? Over to you, Annalise. Yes, no, thank you for, for your question. Um, so uh, obviously all three consortia set out to address a number of research questions and address a, num a, a wide range of, of research, of knowledge gaps. But where we really uh, leveraged upon coming together as three consortia was obviously with the access to pregnant women cohort studies, and then obviously also the um, affected children born to mothers who had an infection during pregnancy. And, and so with, with, with that, uh, so we had access to a larger sample size, but also access to a better geographic distribution. So Zika Alliance, for example, has an incredibly good um, uh, distribution, many, many sites. 
Um, uh, others like Sig, Sig Action was very strong in their ethics background, had a full work package on ethics that we could all benefit from. And 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 then we had experts um, like like you know statisticians that we could share. And also under the leadership of Thomas Jenisch, we were able to um, you know try to harmonize the variables uh, and try and and the protocols uh, decide what is the minimum requirement for for the harmonizations. Where do we allow it to be different? We are different, and the strength is sometimes also to be different. Um, and then and then pull the data together. And but I think I think the last the most important impact was you know because we were three consortia with an access to probably the largest cohort studies globally. Um, WHO noted it, and we were invited to become part of their coordinated approach that brought many sites together for even larger meta meta analysis of individual patient um, um, uh, numbers. So, so um, I think the uh, the strength was therefore not duplication, but expansion, expansion, by also then maximizing uh, some of the governance structures, so that you have minimal, you know, you, you, you maximize the output with minimal use of of uh, of, of resources, um, uh, and so so I think. Uh, we, we did, a, you know, we, we established a governance structure together, we had a communication channel, we tried to be what Xavier calls a one voice, so we would, you know, we, we could share and advocate together as three consortia, we became, you know, there was a strong visibility because we were, you know, there's two, there are hundreds of people involved in the three consortia. Zika plan alone, hundred, I think Zika action is, is I don't know, but Zika Alliance definitely far more than hundred. So, so, so we were also a very large group. So, so there's visibility, there's critical mass. And with that, you get listening ears. So, so, you know, the politicians, policymakers, leading academic institutions, especially in Brazil, you know, invited us, wanted to be part of it. And, and so we were also part of Globet R meetings, um, etc. So I think that is all for me and, and happy to share more, but I think the others will have much more to add. Thank you. For, excuse me. Thank you very much, Anaris. So now I would like to give the word to Xavier from the Zika Alliance to answer actually the same question. So what is the achievement of your project that you think is having the greatest long-term impact? And what is really the thing that you could achieve with the three consortia working together, which you could not achieve as one project on its own? Over to you, Xavier. Xavier. Thank you very much. Um, I think that one of the one of the real questions that we have is that um, probably this was one of the first times that it was clearly put on the table that different consortia would collaborate to create um, knowledge on a single issue, which was Zika. Um, it was something very clear from the beginning, even if. The rules were not so clear because um, we, we, we have been inventing the rules in, 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 in a way. Um, but the, the real question at the end of that is, did this bring something original? Was it beneficial? And could it become a kind of strategy for the commission when creating calls to answer um, emergency events. I, I think it is the case. And when, when, when you look at this, I mean, we have been discovering the rules, but also new opportunities while collabor collaborating. Um, it seems to me that the different uh, consortia um, had prepared projects that were tackling the issue from very different angles. And that's extremely positive, in fact. The three consortia had different approaches. They had different backgrounds. So they were not just competing, they were extremely complementary. And that's something which is a good lesson, I think for us as scientists and, and people in charge of projects, but also for the commission. Um, it works, it's very positive, but maybe the condition is that the rules should be 
given extremely early, which I think now uh, is the case for the for the, the the current projects, because save a lot of time if this has been integrated in the way you have designed your your your, your project. Other, otherwise, I can um, only repeat what uh, Hadelis has said that we have created actual and efficient common governance instances. And it has been working uh, uh, quite well. And the other thing, which is, I think, extremely important, is that we were out of Europe. We were in, in the Caribbean, in Latin America. So we had foreign partners. And maybe for the first time, they heard only one voice coming from uh, Europe. All of the partners talking together with a single objective and a single strategy. And this is excellent scientifically, but it is also excellent in terms of credibility, of course, um, for the commission and for, for, for the scientific consortia. So I think all these items um, are extremely uh, positive. But now uh, we are not at the end of, of, of a process. In fact, I think we are at the beginning of, of, of a process because it, it has been working. So the consortia are recognized, the networks that have been implemented are recognized. And I think that it, it's absolutely excellent that Annelies um, put some emphasis on, on what will be the legacy and what will be the future uh, for these networks, for these cohorts, for this organization, for all the relationship that has been created with the partners in the Caribbean and in, in, in Latin America. And this has to be invented now. So I think it's not really not the end of the process. It's just the beginning of a second, uh, a second step, and that we have to, and we have to embark our partners and our institutions um, to 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 invent what, what what it should be for the future. Over. Okay. Thank you very much, Xavier. So indeed, you mentioned complementarity, synergies, but not only that. It goes beyond that because I think that what you said is that that your project has strengthened actually each other. So indeed, you, what you could out, what you could get out of it with the three of you is much stronger than what you would get out of it with the three individual projects. And I'm very um, happy about your enthusiasm to continue with this, of course, because uh, I think if you set up something nice like this. You, you should be enthusiastic to, to find ways to continue with it. So my next uh, question is exactly the same question as before, but then directed to, to Carlo Giacinto from Zika Action. So uh, Carlo, please, your next five minutes are for you to uh, yeah. explain. So first of all, I would like to thank you, um, Annalise, Javier, and all the people involved in Zika Alliance and Zika Plan, because for their commitment on women and children. You know, I am a pediatrician, and this is a very personal consideration. And so my life has always been focused to care for pediatric patients and, of course, for mother and women. And this, I think, is the first time that the main focus of three big projects, of course, with the blessing and the behalf of the commission, are really being focused on a vulnerable population, women and children. So that, I think, is a very, very special uh, starting point, which makes, again, this uh, uh, experience and our future work together uh, something quite unique because we have been focused on vulnerable population and that is what it is really needed. I would like also to stress, as Anadis and Javier did already, the complementarity of the networks, because we have been um, you know, looking at uh, uh, the Zika infection, the pandemic, from different perspectives, from basic science, uh, from uh, clinical part, from a social science part, so from a, a lot of different perspectives, you know, address and the bringing different countries from different projects. For instance, in, in we brought uh, um, um, in, in the Caribbean, Haiti and Jamaica, and, uh, uh, you know, um, Zika Alliance brought a lot of Latin American countries there has been a lot of arboviral experience that we didn't have in our network so i think we learned a lot 
and we hope that uh, we really have been able to deliver quite a few uh, quite a few important things so beyond that we do have something very concrete so Annalise mentioned briefly the work that uh, um, the, the, the uh, Thomas Yenish led work package led working group uh, uh, really was uh, on uh, harmonizing the data, the data collection. And this is going really to be extremely important, not just uh, in the future eventually to be ready to, to see um, possible a new emergency of the Zika epidemic, but really as an infrastructure, as a basis to look at uh, mother to child transmission of uh, uh, other disease and COVID could be really an, uh, an example. So then another important point that uh, I would like to stress is that uh, as a part of the legacy, as uh, especially for those like you know, PENT, as you know, it is a pediatric research network, we were really able to, to set up uh, this vertical transmission study and pediatric registry in sites which were not previously part of our network. So already for some of these sites, we have been starting other work for other projects outside of Zika. And that I think is going to be something extremely important as well as the, the possibility that we think we will, in the, we will have in the future to work all together. And uh, again, and last but not least, I would like also uh, to mention the work that uh, um, we did really facilitate the WHO IPD meta-analysis, which is something which uh, was really, I think, really strengthened by the participation of our consortia. So we were able really to contribute to um, a larger era and uh, international project, which were beyond uh, our initial uh, scope. So uh, again, I, I would really like to, uh, to thank uh, again uh, Zika Alliance and uh, Zika Plants, all their collaborators, and of course the European Commission for uh, uh, this first milestone of uh, our uh, trip and journey together that I hope uh, will last uh, much, much longer. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlo. And indeed, so you mentioned already, of course, how some of the work that, that you initiated within the Zika project is feeding over into new projects, especially also the, the project on COVID-19. And I think it's, uh, it's, again, a very important element. So the experience you had also in the data area is very useful, of course, to, to deal with in the current uh, projects that are working on COVID-19. So my next question is uh, to Professor Trudy Lang. I think that you are involved in all three of the projects, so you're really an, an, a glue factor probably between these two, three projects. And what I would like to ask you is, how has the development of RED-E through these three Zika consortia efforts helped to leverage the role of RED-E in response to COVID-19? So how was the sustainability of RED-E actually promoted? Over to you, uh, Trudy. Thank you very much. And um, it's just great to have everybody brought together and, and try and summarize what we've all been doing over the last few years. So um, yeah, well done, everybody, and thank you. Um, well, exactly. I think for us, the um, you know, who we were a year ago, um, and it enabled us to really put in place everything we have established with Ready and bringing all of our partners together and linking it up with other projects and initiatives is the whole point. You know, the, the EU Commission tasked us at the beginning of this grant to work across all three consortia. As you say, I was going to use the phrase, the glue that brings it all together, um, tasked us with being a cross-cutting element um, to try and make the, the sum greater than the parts, as we said, and, and what we have achieved, I'll, I'm going to present later on, um, but it is this huge community of practice. And about um, two years ago, we secured this, the future of, of READY through our partnership with FIA Cruz, um, and also have been working to link ready up with many other sort of emerging um, research networks in the region, but also more widely across um, Africa, say, and Asia, with our other partners within the Global Health Network. And so, as soon immediately, the, the, it, it was clear what was happening with the with the pandemic, 
we we set up um, the um, international um, re um, response from our perspective to COVID by by setting up the global health research implementation hub for for COVID nineteen and and Ready was the leadership group for that in Latin America and and within that hub you can see where we have Latin America Asia and Africa and the intent was to bring exactly the same resources tools and awareness to researchers in in those settings as were available anywhere in the world so everybody had the same equitable chance to conduct research within the, the pandemic and, and learn in their own settings and the ready network just completely was able to step in and with the um working very strongly with fear Cruz. Um, we were able to get resources out in, in Spanish and Portuguese. We could link up groups in Brazil with groups in, in Mozambique and Angola. And um, I'm going to talk more of the details later. But, you know, we were tasked with ready of having a network that could support research capacity building in Zika and then be ready for another <laughs> outbreak. And so we've just that's just rolled straight into to COVID-19. But it does that because it's putting in place the capacity to work on everyday diseases that affect populations and I think that's my main point is we hear a lot about talking about preparedness research and I think that's a, a really um, almost an oxymoron that you, you can't just suddenly be prepared for research and only by having ongoing research capabilities in healthcare facilities that's able every day to, to gather evidence on the diseases that are in front of people every day only then can those skills abilities and mandate pivot to work on an outbreak and that's the goal of the ready network to, in, to embed research capabilities for the everyday that can respond to an outbreak and, and that's what we've then harnessed here working with all the partners and, and, um, and the networks we've established as I'll, as I'll talk to you later. Okay, thank you very much Trudy. I think indeed this is very important. We see that also on, on the European level that what we are investing in is ready networks to, to deal with the pandemics and to deal with infectious diseases in general. So my next question will be for uh, Thomas Janis, who is the Zika Alliance work package leader, but also as Annelies already mentioned, the recorded coordinator. So, Thomas, I would like to ask you, how do you assess today, also in the context of the COVID pandemic, the possibilities for harmonizing and sharing international cohort data? And, and how does that compare how the situation today is with how the situation was when the Zika project actually started? And do you think that these Zika projects have contributed to, to a real change of, of data sharing possibilities? So I'm very curious on, on what your opinion about this, uh, Thomas. Over to you. Thanks, Arjun. And I, I have to start with a little bit of a background in order to get to your question in the end. So first, I want to say I'm very enthusiastic about what we set up in terms of continuing pregnant women and children cohorts in Zika Alliance, Zika Action, and, uh, and Zika Plan. And uh, the interesting point is, We've been working with some of these cohorts for a long time in bringing in, for example, cohorts from another EC project that I coordinated on Dengue, the items project. And interestingly, we had three EC funded Dengue projects even that have been collaborating, not as closely as the Zika projects, but there's quite a legacy mm -hmm. also that comes from the, the previous um, round of projects on arboviruses. And I also want to mention that within Zika Alliance, we have actually repurposed our children cohorts to, to COVID with the help or with the permission of the commission. We have discussed this last year and we have uh, started within Zika Alliance then to, to carry over and uh, allow our partners to um, work on vertical transmission and on uh, perinatal transmission of COVID. And, and this is something that has now been included in the orchestra cohort that you have mentioned. So we are partners with some of the Latin American sites in orchestra, albeit it's only a small, small component. And clearly we would like to carry on with this in a bigger platform and in, in, in a bigger um, sustainable way of, of cohort research. Um, Zika has disappeared really fast. Still, we don't understand why it has disappeared as fast as it, as it did. So in a way we, we think it might come back, but it, no, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. And at, as we started, there was parallel epidemics of dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. So it's really that landscape of 
uh, interacting parallel arbovirus epidemics that we were operating in at that point in time. So with regard to recoded and, and Zika Alliance, I think that Zika Alliance and the other Zika projects and the, the common work packages on data sharing really paved the way then to um, make the problems obvious and the challenges obvious, but also the potential obvious for data sharing between infectious disease cohorts. And that was picked up in, in the recorded project. And we also are very intricately involved as uh, uh, Carlos and other, others have mentioned in the WHO IPDMA. So the team in Heidelberg that I um, work with is actually also the team that uh, is uh, coordinating the WHO IPDMA on Zika. I'm one of the co-chairs of the WHO IPD on Zika. Lauren, Lauren Maxwell of the team that is included in, in Recoded. She's uh, leading the, the IPDMA Zika cohort studies or mm -hmm. as a moderator. And I think that we can be proud of this because it's really in the sense of no duplication feeding our strength into this bigger WHO moderated consortium on um, Zika cohorts. Still, we all have our own cohorts and within the three EC funded Zika consortia, there was a lot of sharing and harmonizing. We um, have shared um, or harmonized data dictionaries, a harmonized data analysis plan. Um, we have common lessons that we learned. We are, have put that data together uh, on various levels and we are gonna analyze data together on various levels as well. And, and this has really become easier. I think the technological challenges and the IP intellectual property related challenges with regard to data sharing have really decreased and, and scientists are more ready to share data and it's kind of a no brainer. Of course, we are gonna share data. At the same time, however, the GDPR, the European Data Protection Regulation was uh, started or kicked in. So it was actually starting in 2016, but for many institutions, it was a slightly longer transition turnover so that by 2018, 2019, really everybody got the message. And what we are faced in in Recoded right now is more the legal challenges than the challenges of the scientists not wanting to share data. So we are, we are struggling a lot with that part and uh, we are ready from a technological point of view and from a IP or a scientific point of view to share data. And uh, that's just what it is right now. That's where the field is. And, and we have, I think a very good partnership also between the, the other EU Canada funded projects that Recoded is a part of. There was five or six sister projects funded and they work a lot on, on technological challenges like virtual federated bio, um, data analysis software and how data can be analyzed, not leaving physically, not leaving the original place where it was generated. But those are all solutions trying to um, counteract the challenges that we have because of the GDPR and the data privacy. And we all understand why it's necessary because big companies like Google or Facebook want to uh, sell our data in a way that's a very, very short um, sketch of it. But we are faced with these challenges in this scientific arena now as well. And I think what I would like also in Recoded and what we plan is that we have kind of a bigger uh, platform with the um, regulators or with the commission, with the funders, with the projects, with the scientists who are who are faced with these challenges to look for, for common solutions because some of these challenges are beyond what a single scientific project can deliver. But still the good news is the, the, the overall notion, data sharing, that data harmonization is important and scientists agree about that. And it is very, evident because in Zika, we are faced with that challenge that we individually don't have enough cases or enough numbers to, to tackle certain questions by ourselves. And this is why we need to put our data together in order to reply or respond to certain scientific questions that need larger numbers. Um, I think the last point 
very briefly, I want to touch on is preparedness. Um, I think, and I agree with Trudy, you can't be prepared without having capacity building for these local um, research centers. And there needs to be continuous ongoing research in order to have that capacity being perpetuated. And these cohorts that we have started, they lend itself to being capacity building sites, but also dissemination sites for good quality research surveillance. And last but not least, diagnostics. We have seen that in preparedness, the, the challenges of diagnostics have been coming back to us all over and every time again. And we need a good strategy how to come up with preparedness in diagnostics. And I think Xavier can, can talk about this more, even more if, <laughs> if there is time for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. I think that that was very important, the things you've been saying. And of course, currently in the COVID-19 pandemic, we also run into these issues of, of data and we're very much supporting data sharing, open data, also via the COVID-19 uh, data platform that's been set up for this. But indeed, of course, there are still quite a number of challenges to deal with. But I think here you have, uh, you have made a very good start with the Zika projects. So um, I think we, we learn from the experience that you've built up with your projects and also that you take forward now in the recorded uh, project. So now I would like to open the floor a bit more for the questions. Um, I will take them one by one as they're coming in. So the first question is actually about the three consortia and the working together. So I think this question aims at, is it better now to create one united consortium or is, is really the power still in individual consortia working together? So of course, now you have the experience with the three different uh, projects that are working together. Would that be your optimal way of continuation or would you say, well, it's better to have actually one very large uh, consortium? Annelies, do you want to take this question? If it's for a specific question, for example, really narrowing it down to the pregnant women core studies and following up the children born with congenital Zika syndrome, I think one consortium uh, would be better uh, for, the, for, the, for the future's purpose. If for looking backward, th though, it was better to have the three consortium working independently, but having cross-cutting work packages and having an, and some shared and harmonized work packages, but still with, with a lot of questions that were complementary. Uh, to this to this end, you know, um, you know, we everyone seems to focus only on congenital Zika syndrome, but we have a lot of neurological complications in adults. And uh, with Carlos Pardo being being here, I think, and who led the NeuroZika, which, for example, in our program took three times more money. Than the, than, than, the, than the pregnant woman course studies. Uh, and, and, and we were the only ones doing the neuros, or we were mainly the only ones who did the, the, the adult complications, the neurological complications. So, so maybe I want to give, if you don't mind, Arion, um, whether, whether Carlos could just highlight some of his, uh, of his insights from a neuro Zika adult. Uh, male, I mean, or non-pregnant non <laughs> uh, focus, um, Carlos. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Annelies. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very important question. And, and, and let me introduce myself. I am a clinical neurologist uh, originally from Colombia. And in Co Colombia, as many Latin American countries have been impacted for many decades by arbovirus infections. Uh, we have experienced outbreaks of uh, dengue. We have experienced outbreaks of chikungunya. And in 2015 and 16, obviously we got the impact of uh, Zika that came with a different flavor as compared with the other arboviruses. And it was the magnitude of neurological complications associated with the sick infection. So with that as a focus, actually uh, in Colombia, we have the opportunity to uh, establish and integrate a network that was focused in neurological problems. And this is basically was the origin of the NEAS network that stands for Neurovirus Emerging in the American Study, in which our main focus was to investigate what is the role that infections uh, like arboviral infections like Zika 
may play in uh, uh, the uh, presence of neuroinflammatory disorders like Guillain-Barre, that is a very devastating uh, 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 paralytical disorder that basically produce a lot of uh, uh, neurological uh, uh, disability and long-term consequence, similar to many of the uh, effects of Zika in the pediatric population. But in the adult population, both Guillain-Barre and encephalitis and myelitis have the same capability for producing long-term effects. So by establishing our network in Colombia that integrate basically uh, different centers around the country, uh, uh, that uh, network allow us to uh, establish a, a very good connectivity with different disciplines uh, uh, of uh, clinical research and uh, basic science research. We have the capability to integrate the epidemiologists with the clinician and virologists and laboratory workers. And this is actually one of the major uh, 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 effects uh, that the Zika plan produced in our uh, research uh, focus was our ability to create and integrate this uh, network of uh, researchers. But the, the most important part as well was the ability that we had to integrate with the international networks. And for example, uh, uh, in the case of Guillain Barre, we have the opportunity to uh, interact and integrate to the efforts of the IGOS, that is the International Guillain Barre Outcome Study, that is lead, uh, it's led by uh, Dr. Bart Jacobs uh, in the uh, Netherlands. We have the capability to integrate with uh, Dr. Tom Solomon, Professor Solomon in Liverpool, and Professor Hugh Willingston in, in Glasgow, and many other colleagues in Latin America like Lucia Brito. So the integration with the international groups that are focused on neurological disorder was a very good advantage for uh, our research uh, consortium in Colombia. And that basically uh, facilitated us to produce data and, and, and sustain the research uh, activities of the network because uh, we learn a lot uh, from the observational studies initially, but we later embark in uh, case control studies for understanding what is the real role of arboviral infection like Zika in presence of uh, uh, acute neuroinflammatory disorder. So that actually is a very important product, is the uh, ability that we have to generate more research uh, uh, organized research like case control studies, and also from there to go to more detailed analysis like genomic analysis of the viruses that are circulating in, uh, uh, in the Colombian uh, environment and how those viruses may affect the uh, health of uh, the population. But the most important part as an outcome of this network is that allow us to be prepared for the next outbreak. And that happened in 2020 with the outbreak of, uh, uh, of COVID-19. And our network actually uh, through very important uh, leaders like uh, Lida Osoria, who is an epidemiologist at the Universidad del Valle, and Beatriz Parra, who is a virologist at the Universidad del Valle, allow us actually to be more than ready when COVID-19 uh, hit uh, Colombia. And they play a very important role, not only for developing the strategies, strategies for epidemiological research, but also for laboratory research and diagnosis. And that actually helped us to generate data. And uh, that allow us to generate data that uh, uh, was uh, the basis of support by the National Institute of Health in the United States to continue the network and continue the research effort around the topic of uh, neurovirus emergent uh, arboviruses and the role of those in uh, producing neurological disease. So uh, we went from observational studies to case control studies and we went to generate hypothesis based um, uh, research that allow us actually to propose to NIH to uh, uh, give us support and, and, and obtain support from them to maintain the network uh, for a period of time. And that actually is critical and the support of the Zika plan has been uh, uh, actually uh, very valuable for all of the effort that we have been doing in Colombia and our interactions with colleagues in Brazil, colleagues in Peru and other Latin American countries that are confronting similar uh, challenges of arboviral infections and more recently problems like uh, COVID-19.
Thank you very much, uh, Carlo. I think that is very important to see how the project has, has leveraged actually additional funding and how you continue activities. I think that is uh, it's great to, to hear from you. So um, I will go on to the next question that has come in in the chat, uh, which is from Tom Solomon. Are there lessons for the funders in terms of how to fund three consortia in a competition, but avoiding overlap between projects? What are the reflections of the three consortia leads on this? So does any of you consortium leads want to comment on that or? I can say a few words, maybe. Yes, please. Um, I think I think that the issue is maybe a little bit more complicated than um, proposed by Tom. Because um, Annalise said very well that if you have a very identif clearly identified objective, limited, one consortium is probably more efficient than different consortia. Mm -hmm. But when you face a pandemic, having a single consortium makes no sense. You must tackle the issue from very different angles. That's, that's clear. So that's the first part. The second one is we have discussed all together the issue of competing or not competing on some aspects. And I think that globally, it's absolutely important that different consortia collaborate and they produce um, what is expected from them in terms of knowledge and information. And in my opinion, it's not simplistic to, to say that, and we can admit, and we have admitted and accepted some partial competition on some specific aspects, because we thought that we were not certain that one consortium would, would, would bring um, the, the, the complete answer. And that was rather positive in, in so that's manageable. So um, clearly um, creating consortia that compete on everything, um, and, 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 and lose their time and duplicate all of the efforts is ridiculous. But admitting that some tricky parts of the problem can be studied by different consortia if they share the data and if they try to go ahead with the, the data that they collect is not something ridiculous when you face a new situation where, where you don't know what you are, you are talking about and, and, and you are no precise idea where you where you are going. So I would I would answer to to, to Tom. Um, it's probably some a, a subtle balance between organizing the consortia in such a way that they don't com compete stupidly, but let them compete sometimes on specific issues if this is correctly managed at the level of the direction of the, the different consortia. Over. Thank you very much, Xavier. So maybe I can give some commands from my side, also from the funder side, because of course what we are doing is when we're issuing a research call, we want the best research projects to come on top. And that is an open competition. So, but in the end, of course, you do not want to want to end up with a set of research projects that are working in isolation and that are competing with each other or that are having overlapping activities because if two research projects are doing the same, it's actually a waste of, of taxpayers' money invested in that without a very good coordination and division of tasks. So I think, again, here, the, the SICA project have set a, the good example with three different research projects, but very well connected with each other through this uh, common work package. So I think this is something that, uh, that we really like to see in this area. So the next question comes from uh, Sony Bashkar. What could funding agencies do to facilitate and reward open sharing of data funded by public agencies? So I think, Thomas, I would give the words to you to answer this one. So a few things. I think one important component is funding agencies should agree on a clause of 
broad informed consent to be included in future studies. And that should perhaps be mandatory if it's okay with local or national legislations. We are struggling a lot now with studies that didn't include broad informed consent initially and uh, then to go back and maybe have to reconsent all participants or have to work with a number of IRB, uh, so ethical review committees in different countries is a lot of additional work. So I think a, a harmonized language of broad informed consent that is almost mandatory for the future would be very helpful. And uh, then the question was really rewarding. So you know how this, the benefits or incentives in science are, are being distributed. It's, a, it's about impact points, it's about publishing, it's about having uh, the institution named. So we, there have been ideas of uh, rewarding scientists for sharing in open repositories and that maybe needs to be something that is relevant for career advancement for scientists and needs to, needs to also come with some kind of reward points. I think we don't have a clear system right now, but there would be, this would be an area of work for the future to come up with incentive structures that reward scientists so that they can also advance their careers. Because in the end, scientists are under the pressure to publish and then they can, they can advance their careers. If they can advance their careers by publishing open data, this would be great as well. And uh, it's the same with reviewing papers. Currently, there's not much reward for reviewing papers, but that is also kind of changing in, 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 a, in a good way. Um, so yes, in uh, informed consent, broad informed consent is a big thing. I think we need to tackle some of the um, side effects of the GDPR, like I mentioned before, mm -hmm. but we also need a, a, a incentive structure for scientists so that sharing behavior is rewarded. Over. Thank you very much, Thomas. I think it's very important elements that you brought forward indeed. So it's the, the rewarding is very important, of course, for people that are doing the job, the scientists, and indeed the, the informed consent uh, is, is very important. So that it's indeed covering what we want to do with the, with the data and with the material. So with this, I think we're nicely on time with this session. So I would first of all, would like to thank all the panelists in this panel for their very valuable contributions and for the, the information that they shared with us. And with this, I would like to return the word to Annelies. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Ion, for, for moderating this, this session, this panel discussion. Um, and we also want to thank you for, no, not, not you personally, but the European Commission, of course, for, for funding us here. And but also, um, you know, making sure that the work package were aligned so that we, and, and we created additional work packages to have an aligned governance, um, et cetera, and, and, and force us to do so. Uh, so the, to, to me, I always say, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you know, you go, you go with many people. So, and that's and that's what we did. It did it did slow us down in the beginning. We have to openly admit this. It, it did slow us down. And there were additional meetings and and uh, costs to meet with the others. Um, but in the in the long run, you have a, you have an expanded output. So so thanking you on the, on this regard. When a cluster of children born with abnormally small head circumferences was detected in northeast Brazil in late 2015, identifying the cause of this rapid and unprecedented surge in microcephaly cases was the immediate need that the medical and scientific community was called to meet. Under the leadership of Brazilian infectious disease experts, a task force, the Microcephaly Epidemic Research Group, was formed bringing together expertise in epidemiology, virology, immunology and social medicine, and cultivating partnerships with other eminent clinic epidemiological investigators across Brazil and worldwide. 
the group laid the groundwork for what was to become the Zika Preparedness Latin American Network, Zika Plan, a multinational project that would not only facilitate research to investigate Zika virus, but also create a long-term platform through which the global scientific community would be available to respond rapidly to any future emerging threats in Latin America. Hosted by Sweden's Ume University and led by scientific coordinator, Professor Annelies Wilder-Smith, alongside project coordinator, Dr. Raman Preet. They were expertly placed to respond to a call from the European Commission as it released funds to investigate the outbreak after the World Health Organization declared Zika a public health emergency of international concern in 2016. Zika Plan harmonized study protocols and initiated a series of groundbreaking epidemiological studies that advanced scientific thought by connecting the microcephaly cases to Zika virus infections in pregnancy and ruling out alternative hypotheses, such as larvicide. This also led to the first clinical description of a new disease, congenital Zika syndrome. What had previously been thought of as a benign mosquito-borne virus was soon recognized as a global threat, capable of causing severe teratogenic effects. With the epidemic of microcephaly, we learned that Zika virus can cross the placenta and profoundly affect fetal development, resulting in structural anomalies and functional impairments that may require lifelong care. The partnership and support of Zika Plan facilitated to build and follow the Merg pregnancy and pediatric cohorts to describe the risk, the spectrum, and the evolution of the congenital Zika syndrome. Our investigations have contributed to understanding this syndrome as a spectrum of clinical features that may include vision, swallowing, communication, and neurodevelopment impairments and microcephaly. From the outset, Investigators focused on building connections, including with the families of children with congenital Zika syndrome, creating relationships and systems through which those working in the field and those investigating in the lab could share data would be vital to ensuring a timely and sustainable response. Over the last five years, Zika Plan has yielded some of the most robust estimates to date of the absolute risks associated with congenital Zika virus infections, and also provided unique insights regarding the prognosis and health needs of children born with congenital Zika syndrome. With close monitoring of the health and development of more than 700 children, the MERGE pediatric cohort represents the largest single cohort study of children with congenital Zika syndrome and is a uniquely valuable resource for understanding this new disease. In parallel, the research of the Zika-IF cohort has provided unique insights into the vertical transmission of Zika virus and the implications of congenital infection for neurodevelopment. Across the whole of Brazil, the Microcephaly Epidemic Research Group facilitated a nationwide consortium of Zika pregnancy and pediatric cohort studies known as the Zika Brazilian Cohorts Consortium, which has supported rapid data sharing to inform Brazilian Ministry of Health policy. Internationally, the Microcephaly Epidemic Research Group has worked closely with a range of international investigators as part of a large-scale international consortia, including not only Zika Plan, but also the European Commission-funded Zika Cohorts Vertical Transmission Study Group and the World Health Organization-led Zika Virus Individual Participant Data Consortium. Engaging with policymakers, public health officials and affected families was prioritized throughout, so that their scientific findings would be expediently translated into evidence-based policy. The group's work informed the Zika-related guidance of the Pan-American Health Organization and the Brazilian Ministry of Health. And in fact, it was largely thanks to the advocacy of the Microcephaly Epidemic Research Group 
that the World Health Organization and the National Health Emergency in Brazil recognize the cluster of microcephaly and other neurologic disorders as a public health emergency of international concern. The scale and dedication of the group's efforts set an important new precedent for how the global scientific community should respond to emerging infectious threats, including today's COVID-19 pandemic. While the Zika virus pandemic has ended, the devastating health and social impact on children with congenital Zika syndrome and their families continue. In looking forward, our top priority as a research team is on understanding how congenital Zika virus infections may influence children's neurodevelopment and behavior as they reach school age and beyond. We hope to continue to work together through our meaningful international partnerships to understand the needs of affected children so that we can better advocate for effective support services for children with congenital Zika syndrome and their families. Thank you, thank you for, for the team at the Fondation Merieux who put together um, this, this film. We put together in total four films, but we will only be sharing one today and the others will go all up on the Zika Plan website. So united we are to fight against Zika. Today's webinar uh, will uh, have the following big themes. It's harnessing technologies, harnessing networks and advancing innovations.